To be honest with you, the word codependent was a terrible choice because codependency at the end of the day is a relational style that somebody adapts that has nothing to do with being dependent. I could probably write an entire book on codependency. Not probably, I definitely could. About what gives rise to it, about the different behaviors that come with it, but what is important for you to understand today is that it is a relational style that people adopt and then they carry it through into their adult life, but they adopt it and make that adaptation because they are in an unhealthy social environment. If you would like to learn more about this, you can watch my videos titled The Truth About Narcissism and Codependency, as well as Codependency Has Nothing to Do with Dependency. What is important to understand for the sake of the information that I'm about to share with you in this video is that people who adopt this style of relating to others, which we call codependency, they do so because they're in an environment where the way that they feel in that environment is that nobody is actually there for their best interests, looking out for their well-being, or an ally to their welfare. Because of this, they decide the best way to survive is to get their own needs met by sacrificing parts of themselves so as to conform to other people's interests. And they create an attuned emotional contract with them whereby their own needs are manipulatively met in exchange for doing so. It's also important to know that you will hear pretty much everywhere that codependents place a lower priority on their own needs while obsessively focusing on the needs of others, and this is not true. It only looks like this on the outside. What's really happening is that this preoccupation with the needs of others is simply their way of getting their own needs met. In any relationship, confluence is that feeling of we. It is that sensation of togetherness, unison, agreement, alignment, alliance. <laughs> Basically the opposite of conflict, the opposite of being against each other. Probably the best way to visualize confluence is to think about two streams that are coming to join as one, but one that becomes more. Confluence is about harmony, and confluence is something that everyone wants in relationships. I mean, ultimately, that's what feels good to us. So we're all wanting confluence, but not at any cost. If we have adopted this relational style of codependency, what sets us apart from other people is that we are after confluence no matter the cost. We go to lengths to establish confluence that are detrimental to ourselves and to anyone we're in a relationship with. For example, we usually grew up in households where difference meant conflict. Therefore, for the sake of creating confluence, we abandoned our authenticity and made ourselves the same as others, or made ourselves into whatever they wanted us to be. Or, for example, for the sake of confluence, we also learned to enable dysfunctional behavior in others. Very big deal for codependency. And here's the thing. What sets codependency apart also is that with the style of codependency, you are perfectly willing to fake confluence. If we have adopted this relational style of codependency, the reason ultimately that we did this is that we learned in our environment growing up and potentially our current society, we learned that anything but confluence was incredibly dangerous. This means this is our strategy of avoidance. We're wanting to avoid pain and we're wanting to get our needs met and we have decided the only way to make that happen is to create confluence. Even if we have to fake it, even if we have to do horribly abusive things and distort ourselves in order to create it, it's basically whatever I have to do to myself to create confluence and whatever I have to do that damages others to create confluence, that's what I'm doing. It's a literal self-survival mechanism. What does this mean? This means that if you have this codependency style in relationships, you don't just like confluence. Confluence is that buoy that you hold to as if you are stranded in the middle of the ocean in a squall. It is so important to understand this relationship, often a subconscious one, that people who fit into this codependent spectrum have with confluence 
because it is this relationship they have with confluence that opens up the door for an incredible mind trick. It opens up the door for somebody to be in a state of total inauthenticity, but being completely convinced that it's authentic. Here's what I mean. Or I should say, here's the trick. If you have adopted the relational style of codependency, you care so much, often on a subconscious level, about confluence that it registers in your system as your top value and therefore your top priority. This means that letting go of any other personal truth you might have so as to establish confluence with someone will actually feel like relief. It will feel good and it will feel right and it will feel authentic because in doing so you are in alignment with your top subconscious value. So that you can understand this mind trick better, I've got an example for you. Tom is married to Sandy. Tom has adopted a relational style of codependency. The reality, meaning the authentic truth about Tom is that he is a little bit of a thrill seeker. He feels more alive when he's taking risks. And this man loves capital, L loves adventure. Here's the thing. Sandy is not this way at all. She loves predictability, loves routine. She's a serious homebody. She loves staying at home with her cats and gardening. Sandy gets upset anytime that Tom takes a risk or suggests that they change their routine or strikes out on some kind of an adventure. This upsets her. Now, Sandy is not a master of relationships by any means, but interestingly enough, she's not actually narcissistic. She has not adopted the narcissistic style of relating to other people. Still, this doesn't stop Tom from slipping into these codependent behaviors relative to Sandy. Tom does not know how to deal with incompatibility in a relationship. And whenever Sandy gets upset, the feeling of not being aligned with her is viscerally terrorizing. His desperate attachment to confluence is triggered, and so Tom goes to work denying the truth that he loves adventure and trying to get rid of his tendency towards risk-taking. Tom does this in many ways. Let's look at some of them. He denies, suppresses, and disowns the part of him that likes risk-taking, the part of him that wants adventure. He makes an absolute enemy of it internally. After all, he has to deny, suppress, and disown anything that is a threat to his confluence with Sandy. He decides that being a risk taker is not a truth about himself. It's an unhealthy addiction. And to validate this new idea of his, which just so happens to bring him into confluence with Sandy, he reads all kinds of books on the dangers of risk taking and on how it's an addiction. He also watches all kinds of documentary films about bad things that happen to people who take risks. He also attends Buddhist seminars about being in the present moment and about the beauty of the mundane. He decides that even exploring his own neighborhood can be an adventure if he decides to make it one. He forces himself to stick to the routine and engage in the many homebody activities that Sandy's engaged in, such as reading and cooking and gardening and watching TV and taking neighborhood walks. And here's the thing, at first doing this feels so good and it feels so right. Why? Because at first when he starts doing this, he gets that confluence back and because that's his top priority and his top need, his entire nervous system downregulates. <gasps> oh. Because it feels so good and so right, he is going to feel as if it is authentic, at least in the beginning. And here's the thing. This is the real mind trick. It is authentic. <laughs> it's authentic because his top priority is confluence and he's just acted in alignment with it to the detriment of every other part of him. So hold the phone. This is what it looks like. What he has just done is he has had to disown and deny all kinds of other elements of authenticity for his one authentic truth, which is that his top priority is confluence. Tom is not satisfied with his life because he is denying the truth about himself to be in alignment with the truth that he wants confluence in his marriage. Again and again, these feelings of dissatisfaction will creep to the surface, and when it does, he becomes compelled to break the routine or go for an adventure or act out in some way. But when it happens, 
Again, it threatens his sense of confluence, so he quickly suppresses them again. And when he does, again he feels relief. Again he feels like he's back on track and doing what's right and true for himself, simply because he's attained confluence. Even today, Tom will look at you straight in the face, and he will say, you know, we're just two homebodies. At the end of the day, there's just so much beauty in what happens in simple everyday life. And honestly, I believe that people nowadays are just so swept up in the constant seeking of intensity that they've forgotten the beauty of simplicity. The mind trick is that your attachment to confluence acts like a smokescreen for your personal truths in that you do authentically want confluence. So anything you might do to attain it, including being dishonest and inauthentic, may feel like you're being honest and authentic to you. If you are someone who struggles with this mind trick, here are some suggestions. Number one, recognize when a personal truth would stand to grant you confluence with someone and therefore you could be at risk of being in this pattern. And if a truth would stand to grant you confluence, that truth needs to be treated with suspicion. Most people who are in this pattern, whenever they have a truth crop up that would grant them confluence with somebody, they don't question it. They don't treat it with suspicion. What they do is automatically hook, line, and sinker it. It's an American expression, meaning ah, they swallow it immediately and it's just like, yes, because it feels so good. You need to question whether or not that truth is actually your truth or whether it is simply something you are doing to get confluence. On top of this, you seriously need, seriously need to question your relationship to compromise in relationships. You can't be in this pattern of codependency in relationships and not believe at some level in compromise in relationships. So have you examined your relationship with compromise? Essentially, you're perfectly willing to give things up or change things about yourself potentially out of alignment with your authenticity, so as to achieve confluence in your relationships. For this reason, you would benefit by watching two of my videos. The first titled, Why You Should Never Make Compromises in a Relationship, and the second titled, Do You Base Your Relationships on Compromise or Compatibility? Two, you need to familiarize yourself and memorize the difference between the feeling of these two very different states. On the one hand, the state of something being very real or very true, and on the other hand, the sensation that occurs in your body when your nervous system is downregulated because you have gotten out of danger or you have attained some desperate need of yours, i.e. confluence. One exercise that you can do to familiarize yourself with the difference in these sensations, so you can recognize the difference between them, is that first you can close your eyes and you can imagine yourself in a conflict. Imagine you're in trouble. Now then, in this visualization, I want you to imagine yourself getting out of trouble, i.e. creating confluence with somebody, so that they're suddenly, instead of being upset with you, they're happy with you, and they're approving of you, and they're feeling good, and you're feeling that confluence feeling of we and harmony. Feel what that feels like in your body. Feel the downregulation of your nervous system, and the intense relief. Now we're going to switch to a different visualization. The next visualization that you're going to do, that you're going to switch this to, is that you're going to imagine a truth that you can't have be untrue. You can't make it untrue, no matter how hard you try. This could be something you're completely convinced of. Something that has your complete conviction. It could be anything. Or it could be something that you can't deny. Like, I was born in the city that I was born in. I want you to feel how that truth creates this sensation of solidness near your core. It's a solid stability in the center of your being. Two very different feeling flavors. One is truth. That's what happens when something is true. The other is what happens when you have escaped danger. So important to really familiarize yourself and let yourself fully feel the difference in those two sensations because you're mistaking them for the same thing. Notice how both of them have a quality of rightness, but it's a completely different feeling flavor. Free, realize that if you slip into this mind trick, you are exercising the coping mechanism of denial. 
for this reason, you would benefit by learning about denial. To do this, you can watch my video titled How to Call Bullshit on Denial. On top of this, the reality is you're lying to yourself. It's not just that you're lying to other people. And when I use that word, I don't mean that you're intentionally lying to people. You're just willing to do pretty much anything for the sake of confluence, even if that happens to be lying, right? It's not like a malicious thing you're doing, but you're lying to other people and you're lying to yourself, which is the most important element of this. You're not being honest with yourself. After all, it's hard to establish confluence when you know you're lying to yourself, right? <laughs> Obviously that creates this, uh, let's call it a discrepancy internally that most people can't live with. So it's easier just to deny internally. It's easier just to be dishonest with yourself. You are most likely in the pattern of fooling yourself. To do this, you're in the pattern of suppressing, denying, disowning, and reframing your own emotions. This means you tell yourself stories about them so as to obscure the truth they contain. Each emotion is a carrier of a personal truth. That means it contains completely valid information about what is genuinely authentic for you. But if you're in this pattern of codependency, you're not going to look at it and you're not going to take the time to really feel it and mine that emotion for what that truth is that is inherent within that emotion. Instead, when it comes up, you're not going to do anything with it other than I'm going to tell myself a confluence affirming story about it. I'll give you a really quick example. So let's say that you've got a woman who's in this pattern and her husband gets sick. And the truth is she doesn't want to be a caretaker. So she starts to feel all this negative emotion coming up. And the real truth in that negative emotion is I hate taking care of my husband. I don't want to put my energy forth towards bringing him soup and making sure that everything around the house is done that he usually does. And that's the real reason she's feeling bad. But if she's in this pattern of wanting confluence above all else, when that comes up, she's going to tell a confluence affirming story about it rather than actually look at it. Something like, I just hate when he feels bad. It just hurts my heart to see him laying in bed hurting like this. Okay, so again, you're in the pattern of suppressing, denying, disowning, and reframing your own emotions, telling yourself stories about them to obscure the truth they contain. It's critical to notice your emotion and listen to the personal truth carried by these emotions. When something feels off, quote unquote, in your life, especially in your relationship, but you don't know what, chances are high that you're not being honest with yourself because your truth threatens your sense of confluence with someone in your life. If you find yourself in a pattern of self-sabotage or of breaking your word, it means you're not being honest with yourself. If you complain but don't take action, it means you're not being honest with yourself. And here's the thing, to be honest with yourself and other people, you're going to have to risk the loss of confluence, which is why it's so important to be in a conscious relationship with confluence. Four, if you are in this pattern of, let's call it confluence attachment, these things in your relationship, these conflicts will keep coming up over and over and over and over again. Essentially, the truth has a way of rearing its head. I'm going to hit you with something. It is not hard to live in alignment with what is genuinely true for you. You don't have to work at it. In fact, the work and the discipline comes in when you have to work against something that is true for you. Essentially, it's going to feel like you're going to have to be very disciplined to do things despite a part of you that you disapprove of. If you have to work really, really hard and be super disciplined to do something despite parts of yourself, that's an indication that you're denying, suppressing, and disowning a personal truth. For example, imagine that a man is looking for a relationship where he doesn't have responsibility and instead is taken care of. But he got into that relationship with a woman who has no interest in doing this. He will have to actively work against this truth. And he will notice that because it is second nature to live according to your truth, he will slip into behaviors where he doesn't take responsibility or where others are forced to take care of him. Most likely, these are slips that lead to repeated conflict. So like I said, another thing you want to watch for is that the truth keeps rearing its head. It'd be like a, Ugh, why can't I stop doing that? Or a, Ugh, why can't I stop thinking that? Or a, Ugh, why can't I stop feeling that way? It just keeps happening. Five, commit to the mastery of relationship. The thing is, if you fall into this codependency spectrum of style of relationships, 
You're terrified of people. You're afraid of relationships. You associate them with pain. You don't know how to have yourself and have other people too at the same time. All you have ever known in relationships is zero-sum games or manipulation. You don't know how to have a conflict and then create actual resolve. I'm talking genuine resolve where both people still get to maintain their truths. You're walking around in an ocean of coping with your relationships. Also, you tend to placate people before there's even ever a conflict. What does all this mean? It means that in relationships, you've got to unlearn a whole lot and then learn a whole lot. It's important to know that if somebody is codependent enough, they don't actually have to be in a relationship with somebody who has adopted the narcissistic style of relationship in order to exhibit these behaviors. In fact, a not so funny joke is all that it takes to make you be perceived as a narcissist in a relationship with a good enough codependent is if you have an opinion or a preference. All that being in a relationship with somebody who has adopted a narcissistic style of relationship does for somebody who has that style of codependency is it reinforces all the patterns, both, in fact, on both sides. And when patterns are reinforced like that, it just makes them all the harder to break out of. After all, there is an awful lot more occasion and reason to create confluence in a relationship with somebody who's perfectly willing to destroy you for their own sake. When something is real, it is very stable and it is very solid, even if it doesn't necessarily feel good. With this constant searching for confluence and when you have found the relief of confluence, there's no stability to it. There's no solidness to it. There's just relief. You are looking for something to feel good even if there is no stability or solidness to it. Underneath what you are saying and doing, it will feel like, like me, like me, like me. You will be looking for one thing, and that is for your nervous system to relax, making it a strategy. This strategy of creating the false experience of confluence in a relationship in order to try to establish and maintain connection does not actually work. It gets you in the moment relief, yes, but it does not allow you to build a relationship based on what is true. So there is no actual relationship. If this is your pattern, you will be prone to duping people. Why? Because the first thing you're going to seek before you've even really met somebody, or when you first meet them, is confluence. So you're going to do whatever it takes to create that confluence, even if it's out of alignment with what is real and what is true. And therefore, you run the very real risk of duping them into thinking that you're somebody that you're not, or thinking that you have truths that you don't have, like things that you don't necessarily like. In the beginning, you're going to run the risk that they are going to think that you are the perfect partner, only to find out that there's somebody else hiding underneath the surface. How do you have a relationship with a person that changes who they are in order to be whatever they sense that you want them to be? How can you feel solid with that? If you can't pin someone down to anything, you're building a relationship with a shapeshifter. Anything you think is compatible one minute won't be the next. As a result, number one, you will not find actual compatibility in a relationship. Number two, you cannot build actual security in that relationship. It's an absolute recipe for building a life that is completely counter to what you want, counter to who you are. You cannot suppress, deny, and disown personal truths, even in favor of that personal truth that confluence is your top priority, because those truths will come out in all kinds of sneaky and subconscious ways. Essentially, it's a recipe for your relationships to become unsafe and to become painful and to most likely end. And on top of all this, it's an exercise in self-hate. Have a good week. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and consider sharing this video with your friends. You can also click on the bell icon to be notified of the next time that I post a video. I want to thank you personally for the bravery that you have to step into awareness. I'll see you in the next video.